It's 7 p.m. Wednesday, July 31st, here in Seoul. Coming up on New Center tonight. Amid stalled nuclear talks with the U.S., North Korea again launches short-range missiles from its east coast. It's the regime's second missile firing in less than a week. South Korea expresses deep concern over the firing, saying the North is threatening the peace drive on the peninsula. Seoul's National Security Council vows to ramp up its military readiness while closely monitoring the situation. Amid worsening South Korea-Japan trade tensions, the two nations' foreign ministers will meet tomorrow in Bangkok on the sidelines of an ASEAN forum. A trilateral meeting of ministers from Seoul, Washington and Tokyo is also set for this week. We have it all covered. And Samsung Electronics' second quarter profits more than half from a year earlier. Weak chip prices and falling smartphone sales have weighed heavily on the firm, but Japan's export curbs are also threatening future profits. New Center begins now. Good evening and welcome to Arirang News Centre, live from Seoul. I'm Noah Ram. And I'm Han Dan. Thanks for joining us. North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles off its east coast this morning, the second such launch in a week. The missiles flew a much shorter distance and a lower altitude than those fired last week. We begin with Arirang's Defence Ministry correspondent, Kim ji -yeon. Just like last Thursday, the missiles fired on Wednesday morning were described by the South Korean military as both short-range and ballistic and were fired in the early hours in a northeasterly direction towards the EC. An official from South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said Wednesday, the missiles, like the last time, are presumed to have been launched using a transporter erector launcher, which is used to move missiles to a desired location. That means the missiles are not bound to a fixed site and the North's movements are therefore harder to predict. The military said it regards Wednesday's and last week's launches to be in the test firing phase and not fully operational and that is capable of intercepting all of the mentioned missiles with the existing Patriot anti-missile system. What's starkly different this time though is the flight distance and altitude. The latest launches flew a much shorter distance than last week's, flying some 250 kilometers and reaching an altitude of around 30 kilometers from near North Korea's eastern city of Wonsan, which is lower than the 50 kilometers recorded last week. The official says it's working with the U.S. to analyze the missiles further, including their trajectory and whether North Korea has succeeded in its test fire. The official said the military is monitoring the situation while maintaining a defense posture in case of additional launches, adding that the military bears in mind that Wednesday's launches could be similar to last week's. The military confirmed last week that the two missiles launched then were both similar to Russia's Iskander-class ballistic missile system, which is known to be able to move away from its original trajectory to change its target or avoid being shot down. Last week, the military pointed out the so-called pull-up maneuver in the missile's final dive phase as the main reason it took a day to finalize the missile's flight distance. It had initially presumed that last Thursday's missiles traveled some 430 and 690 kilometers last Thursday, but then corrected those distances to some 600 kilometers the following day. Kim ji -yeon, Arirang News. Reacting fast to North Korea's second missile launch in a week, South Korea's presidential office expressed strong concerns that such actions could hamper efforts for peace on the Korean peninsula. Our Shin Se-min at the Blue House. South Korea's presidential office expressed deep concerns over North Korea's missile launch Wednesday and saw it as harming efforts to establish peace on the Korean peninsula. The top office in a readout said that the Standing Committee of the National Security Council voiced strong concerns that North Korea's launching of two short-range ballistic missiles could seriously damage the drive for peace. The NSC, however, added that Seoul will ramp up its military readiness while closely monitoring the situation. An emergency meeting of the NSC, presided over by National Security Advisor Chung Eun, was held in the morning soon after the launches. 
They also stressed the need to continue diplomatic efforts to resume the stall talks on denuclearization in view of the new momentum after the leaders of the two Koreas and the U.S. met last month at the border village of Panmunjom. The committee also took up South Korea's row with Japan. Discussing Tokyo's trade restrictions on Seoul, the NSC vowed to use all possible means to deal with Japan's controls on exports to South Korea of materials key to making computer chips, among other things. They also promised to respond firmly if Japan continues its export restrictions. Japan is reportedly on course to drop South Korea from its whitelist of trading partners, and a decision on that could come as soon as this Friday. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Following the North's second missile launch in less than a week, South Korea's defense minister showed confidence in Seoul's military capabilities. He said South Korea has much more advanced military technology than the North and has all the assets necessary to monitor, defend and attack against North Korean provocations. Our Oh Jung-hee reports. Facing continued military provocations from North Korea, South Korea's defense chief stressed that Seoul has much advanced military capabilities than Pyongyang and can ward off any cross-border threat. Speaking at a national defense forum held Wednesday, South Korea's defense minister Chung kyung do said, Early this morning, North Korea fired unidentified projectiles twice. Our military surveillance assets have detected all of them and are perfectly taking countermeasures. Chung emphasized that South Korea is fully capable of intercepting North Korea missiles, and such ability is only becoming stronger by the day. He added that the South Korea military outweighs the North in terms of technology and size. North Korea usually talks about its ballistic missiles, but we have both ballistic and cruise missiles. And the North's missiles are mostly ground-to-ground. -ground. We too have ground-to-ground -ground missiles, in addition to ship-to-ground, submarine-to-ground and air-to-ground weapons. Seoul's military chief also showed confidence when it comes to defending the nation against the short-range missiles Pyongyang fired recently, which resemble Russia's Iskander-class ballistic missiles and have a complicated flying trajectory to track and shut down. Some wonder whether it'd be difficult to intercept these missiles because of their pull-up maneuver at low altitudes, and yes, it could be difficult. But the missiles are still in our target range. And we have had the pull-up technology from long before since our defense agency developed it. Chong stressed that North Korea is indeed an enemy if it threatens and makes provocations against South Korea. And if it comes to that, he highlighted that the military has secured systems to monitor the North's movements and coordinate with the U.S. in real time to defend and attack. He added the military will continue to upgrade these technologies. Oh jung Arirang News. The key regional players surrounding the Korean peninsula were also quick to react to North Korea's latest provocation. The U.S. and Japan said they're closely monitoring the situation, confirming that the missile launches posed no threat to their nations or their allies. China and Russia, meanwhile, have not made much of a comment. Our Kan yong with more. Washington confirmed North Korea's missile launches. NBC News cited two senior U.S. officials as saying Wednesday that the projectiles were short-range missiles. According to CNN, a U.S. official said the missiles posed no threat to the U.S. or its allies and fell into the sea. Quoting a senior official in the Trump administration, CNBC reported that the White House is aware of reports of the launches and will continue to monitor the situation. The Pentagon, however, did not immediately respond to CNBC's request for comment. Meanwhile, according to the Japan Times, Tokyo's defense ministry said the launches did not land in Japan's territorial waters. It added that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said Tokyo will continue to closely cooperate with the U.S. and others without mentioning South Korea. Also, according to the report, Tokyo's defense minister Takeshi Iwaya said it's very regrettable that North Korea is launching missiles again in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. Meanwhile, officials in Beijing and Moscow have not made any direct assessment or comment. 
According to Reuters, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said Beijing hopes the U.S. and North Korea will make positive efforts to promote denuclearization as well as long-term peace and stability. Russian media outlets quickly reported on the launches, but there have been no official statements from Moscow. Kan Yong-woo, Arirang News. U.S. National Security Council officials met with North Korean officials at the inter-Korean border last week, reportedly. According to AP and Reuters on Tuesday, NSC officials delivered photos of the recent Kim Trump DMZ meeting to their North Korean counterparts. And this is expected to have happened during U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton's trip to Seoul last Tuesday and Wednesday. According to these two agencies, North Korean officials told their American counterparts that they are willing to resume negotiations with the U.S. very soon. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also told reporters on his way to the ASEAN Regional Forum that he believes working-level talks with Pyongyang won't begin too late. He explained there has been some preparatory work that delayed the talks. Meanwhile, a group of South Korean lawmakers have arrived in Japan for a two-day visit in a bid to ease tensions and find a diplomatic solution to the Seoul-Tokyo trade spat. During their stay, they will meet with members of Japan's rival parties and urge Tokyo to halt its export controls. For more, we connect to our political correspondent, Kim Minji, who is on the line. Minji, fill us on on what's been taking place so far. Sure. The South Korean parliamentary delegation embarked on a two-day trip to Japan this morning in hopes of becoming the channel for the government of Seoul and Tokyo to find a diplomatic resolution to the ongoing trade dispute. Now, first up on Wednesday was a working lunch with Fukushima Nakaga, chief of a parliamentary union between the two countries and a lawmaker for Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party. Following a closed-door meeting that lasted nearly two hours, the South Korean delegation said that the two sides shared their views on the issue and that the delegation has done what it can do. Take a listen. We're thankful that Japanese lawmakers welcomed us warmly and that there was an opportunity to talk candidly. I was very worried about our trip, but now it feels that it was a good idea to come. We explained our stance, and they talked about their views, and I feel we played our role in narrowing the gap of understanding between the two sides. It feels that we lawmakers have done what we can do. Now, the South Korean lawmakers said that they told their Japanese counterparts that Tokyo's export controls and pushed to move toll from its wet list of countries that face minimal trade restrictions is unjust. They added that, however, Tokyo denies those claims, but that the general consensus was that they agreed that this is a serious issue and that it won't benefit either side should it persist. The Japanese side also vowed to deliver the content of the meeting to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Now, the delegation also met with Natsu Yamaguchi, leader of Japan's Komeito Party, a coalition of the ruling party, where they also delivered full stamps on the matter. The South Korean side asked for cooperation to resolve the issue and on- underscored that Japan's decision to take Seoul off its trade whitelist could have serious implications for bilateral ties. And Yamaguchi reportedly said that there needs to be more efforts and talks between Seoul and Tokyo. Um, a highly anticipated meeting with Toshihiro Yukai, Sec- Secretary General of the ruling party, who is known to be close with Prime Minister Abe, has been postponed to Thursday morning. And also on Thursday's agenda is a press conference with Japanese correspondents, as well as meetings with members of Je- Japanese opposition bloc. That's all I have for now. That was our Kim Min-ji reporting for us there. Thank you. South Korea has launched a new consultative body made up of lawmakers, government officials and representatives from the private sector to deal with Japan's growing trade restrictions against South Korea. Today, they held their first meeting at the National Assembly. Kim mo has more. The joint consultation body involving representatives from the government, parliament and private sector vowed to do its utmost to cooperate and find solutions to Japan's latest export restrictions against South Korea. Wednesday's meeting was attended by dozens of representatives, including Seoul's finance minister Hong Nam-gi, Cho Jong-sik, chief policymaker of the ruling Democratic Party, presidential chief of staff for policy Kim Sang-jo, and the chairman of the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Park yong man During the opening remarks, the presidential chief of staff for policy vowed that the government will continue to work to resolve the trade dispute diplomatically. 
The government will continue efforts to solve the issue swiftly and diplomatically. We are keeping in mind that protecting the life and property of the public is the most important priority of a nation. After an hour-long closed-door meeting, Seoul's finance minister Hong Nam-gi and the chairman of the Korea International Trade Association Kim Young-ju were named co-leaders of the consultative body. Hong said that now that Tokyo is getting ready to expand its trade restrictions on Seoul, they're preparing measures for all possible scenarios, but the details could not be revealed. He said that the participants agreed that first and foremost is to minimize the impact on local companies. Companies will accelerate efforts to stabilize supplies and foster cooperation between small and mid to large sized companies. Our consultative body agreed to inject some 845 million U.S. dollars annually to lower Korea's dependence on Japanese exports. Members of the consultative body promised to come up with both long-term and short-term plans to boost the competitiveness of South Korea's parts and materials industries and to promote localization. There is the possibility that Japan could make similar decisions in the future. We should be able to come up with long-term countermeasures that could become a fundamental solution. While still pressing Japan to withdraw its existing restrictions and stop its plans to expand curbs, participants also vowed to reinforce cooperation with the international community. Kim mo Arirang News. Meanwhile, Foreign Minister Kang kyung hwa is in Thailand for the ASEAN Foreign Ministers Meeting and the ASEAN Regional Forum. She is set to meet her Japanese counterpart tomorrow, as well as her U.S. counterpart sometime this week. For more, we have our Foreign Ministry correspondent Lee ji on the line for us in Bangkok. ji what's the latest? Adam Tolt's Foreign Affairs Ministry announced that Minister Kang will be having her sit-down with Japan's Foreign Minister Taro Kono tomorrow morning. Both ministers arrived earlier today, and their meeting will take place at 8.40 a.m. local time, so that would be 10.40 Korean time. Now, this is the first time the two diplomats will be seeing face-to-face -face after Japan's retaliatory trade restrictions on Seoul earlier this month. But it's not likely that they will find a solution to the issue, as Minister Kang said upon her arrival at the airport, that she will strongly relay Seoul's stance and that they should work to make sure ties are not severed. Now, we're also likely to see a trilateral sit-down with the two diplomats and the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Friday, we hear. Pompeo told traveling press en route to Bangkok that he will be meeting with Ministers Kang and Kono and with the two of them together. He said he will encourage them to find a path forward and that it's important that the two great partners continue to work closely with the U.S. on their efforts to denuclearize North Korea. Now, this comes after Reuters reported that the U.S. has urged the two countries to sign a standstill agreement. Citing a senior U.S. official, Reuters said the standstill agreement would not help now the differences between the two sides, but would prevent further actions taking place for a set of period of time to allow talks to happen. Now, the length of the agreement has not yet been determined. While the U.S. had been cautious on this issue, as Paul and Tokyo are Washington's closest Asian allies, the recent moves show that they will get involved and mediate between the two sides. Now, Chuan, we also hear that uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made remarks on a possible encounter with North Korea in Bangkok. Yes, Adam. Pompeo said he doesn't, partic um, he doesn't think that the North Koreans will be at the event, but if they are, then he looks forward to meeting with Foreign Minister Lee Yong ho Now, we heard from Foreign Affairs sources earlier this week that Lee will be skipping this event, which will be the fourth time in 20 years that the North isn't sending its top diplomat to the ASEAN Regional Forum. Instead, according to Japan's Kyoto News Agency, the North Korean ambassador in Thailand, Kim Debong, is to be participating in the event. But we're going to have to wait and see on that. Now, Chuan, today is the start for Minister Kang's diplomacy over there. Can you tell us what she has lined up? Minister Kang, upon her arrival, has just started her trip with a bilateral sit-down with her counterpart, counterpart from Myanmar, which will be followed by one with the foreign minister of Laos. Now, her official multinational ministerial meetings will start tomorrow, first, with her ASEAN counterpart. She's also to hold her bilateral talk with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi tomorrow morning after her meeting with Kono. Now, Samsung Electronics' second quarter profits have more than halved from a year earlier amid falling chip prices and smartphone sales. 
The firm's semiconductor business especially took a heavy beating, with profits down by more than 70%. Kim Dami with the details. Samsung Electronics profits from its semiconductor business plunged in the second quarter by more than 70% from a year earlier, mainly due to low memory chip prices. The company said Wednesday that it made just 2.88 billion U.S. dollars on chips. It's the lowest figure in five years. Sales fell 4% to around $47 billion, and Samsung's profits overall were down almost 56% from a year earlier. The firm pointed to a falling global demand for memory chips, especially from China, and falling prices for DRAM. Samsung's performance in the three-month period was slightly better, however, than it had a forecast earlier this month. The tech giant also denied rumors that it will reduce its memory chip production. Still, experts say a growing uncertainties caused by Japan's export curbs means Samsung will continue to face pressure. Samsung has reportedly secured emergency stockpiles that can last up to three months, so its production will be fine until September. But if Japan decides to start rejecting applications for export to South Korea, Samsung's production will be affected starting as soon as the last quarter of this year. Meanwhile, there was a turnaround in Samsung's display business, with a 7% jump in sales and an almost 6% jump in operating profits. Despite a slowdown in the market for small to medium-sized displays, the company said new iPhones to be released will help it in the second half of the year. Sales in Samsung's IT mobile business, including smartphones, rose almost 8% on-year with a boost from low-end mid-priced products. That was hampered, though, by tougher competition in that price range and higher marketing costs. Home appliances saw the biggest on-year improvement with profits and sales up 30% and 6% respectively, thanks to sales of OLED TVs and air conditioners. Kim Dami, Arirang News. South Korea's industrial output fell again in June, adding to the already low overall production figure from the month before. The downward trend comes amid reduced production in the nation's service sector. Lee Min-san reports. South Korea's overall industrial output fell 0.7 percent in June compared to a month earlier due to slumping production in the service sectors. Data released by Statistics Korea show industrial production rose 0.9 percent in April on month and edged down 0.3 percent in May. June's production was down for the second straight month and it's the worst it has been since February when the figure plunged 1.9 percent, which was the biggest drop in six years. By sector, production in the service sector shed 1 percent on month in June, while manufacturing production edged up 0.2 percent. That was due to a 4.6 percent increase in semiconductor production that centered a 3.3 percent decline in auto production. However, the total figure was still 2.9 percent lower than the overall output seen in the manufacturing sector in June 2018. Retail sales also dropped 1.6 percent in June due to falling car and clothing sales. Facility investment rose 0.4 percent in June due to increased imports of semiconductor manufacturing equipment and transportation equipment. Sluggish domestic demand and poor performances in uh, export has been the main reason for the fall in the production index. Uh, Today, you know, the statistics by the, the Department of Statistics shows that the um, Korean economy is not doing pretty well. And the uh, expectation is that this kind of downfall will be continued at least a couple of months in the future. Statistics Korea says the increase in facility investment in June was due to a big slump in May, but it was still down from a year earlier. In addition, economic output indicators have been negative since March. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. It looks like the 52-hour maximum work week policy is working out well. Latest figures show the policy has actually led to reduced overtime hours in small and mid-sized companies in Korea. Our Che Shi-young has the story. 
According to data released Wednesday by the Ministry of Employment and Labor, the average overtime hours in May for workers at small and medium-sized firms with at least 300 employees have dropped by as much as 13 hours compared to the same month last year. Workers in the beverages industry saw the largest reduction in overtime hours, working on average of 27.4 hours of overtime in May. That's down by almost 13 hours from the previous year. Employees in the food industry saw their overtime hours reduced by about 11 hours, followed by the plastic and non-metal industries with reductions of roughly 10 hours. Also in May, workers at those firms earned monthly wages of about 3,800 U.S. dollars. That's a jump of 3.6 percent from the same period in 2018. The total number of workers also increased. Small and medium-sized firms with at least 300 workers employed a total of 3 million people in June, a 0.8 percent increase compared to June last year. The statistics come from a court of 30,000 firms asked by the Labor Ministry to submit the relevant data. Choi Xiong, Arirang News. Thousands of Korean football fans were disappointed and angered last week by superstar Cristiano Ronaldo's decision not to take the field when his team Juventus played a friendly match against the K-League All-Stars. Some of them are suing the organizer of the match, saying they didn't get what they paid for. Our Won Jong-hwan reports. Frustration and anger have boiled over among many Korean fans. Cristiano Ronaldo stayed on the bench for the entire exhibition match last Friday at a packed Seoul World Cup stadium. They had been promised that Ronaldo would play at least 45 minutes. He didn't, so thousands have decided to sue. Local law firm Myung-an says those who bought the expensive tickets were not treated in the way they expected or deserved due to Ronaldo's absence from the field. Fans bought these expensive tickets because they believe Ronaldo would be playing and that's why we are demanding compensation because many fans believe they were cheated. The law firm says more than 2,400 people have joined its suit as of Tuesday and they expect many more to join as they continue to sign up plaintiffs through the next week. It's not just compensation for the tickets they want. Another law firm is seeking criminal charges of fraud against Ronaldo himself, Juventus, and the organizer, a company called The Festa, claiming they misled fans into believing Ronaldo would play. A prosecutor turned attorney claims the agency knew Ronaldo would not play, but hid that information to defraud around 65,000 fans of over 5 million U.S. dollars. I believe there are enough evidence on the case to be stated as fraud, especially considering that the organizer knew that there was a chance that Ronaldo could not show up during the match. Fraud can be recognized if we can find evidence that the organizers still continue to sell tickets even if they knew. Meanwhile, South Korea's professional football governing body, K-League, sent a letter of protest to the Italian champions for violating the contract. The K-League said, in a press briefing Tuesday that Juventus threatened to cancel the match if it wasn't shortened or delayed by an hour. The game was eventually delayed by 57 minutes. The K-League hasn't revealed who made the threat, but according to some inside reports, it was the legendary Juventus player and its current vice chairman, Pavel Nedved. Wonjuan, Arirang News. President Trump's new Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, will kick off a tour of the Asia-Pacific region starting Friday. His trip will take him to countries including South Korea, Japan and Mongolia. While in Seoul, Esper is scheduled to have his first meeting with his South Korean counterpart. Top officials will be reviewing the security of the Korean Peninsula and reaffirming the defense relationship between Seoul and Washington. They are also expected to work on a defense cost-sharing deal with the current one expiring at the end of the year. Just when we thought we would be getting clear skies after the monsoon rain, heavy showers have returned to Korea's central region. Seoul and surrounding areas were drenched in overnight downpours, with parts of the west coast receiving up to 125 millimetres of precipitation. Several heavy rain advisories and warnings were issued this morning, but were lifted in the afternoon. Weather authorities say the latest bout of rain is not part of this year's monsoon, which has ended, but the result of heat and air pressure coupled with an unstable atmosphere. The rain is expected to last until tomorrow. 
The number of companies listed on Korea's stock market worth more than 1 trillion won or 800 million US dollars has fallen this month by the biggest margin since last October. According to the Korea Exchange, the Kospi has seven less trillion won firms than the month before and the Kosdaq now has five fewer. There are now just 186 of them in total. The numbers have been steadily declining since February, mainly due to global trade tensions. We're expected to see the so-called supermoon twice next month from August 1st to the 4th and August 30th to September 2nd. The phenomenon takes place when the moon is closer to the Earth than usual. Experts predict this will cause sea levels around the Korean peninsula to rise to a nine-year high. Therefore, people near the shore are being advised to take caution at night and at dawn when sea levels are at their highest. Relevant alerts will be put in place if the levels get too high. That has been your three-minute news flash. The capital had a gloomy day today with on and off showers while the southern regions were under baking hot weather. For more details, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. The rain has stopped apart from a few drizzles at the moment in the capital. However, it's expected to turn heavy as we move into our evening. And until Thursday mornings, Hor, Gyeonggi-do and parts of Gangwon-do provinces will likely receive between 20 to 70 millimeters of rain. But there's also chances of some sudden downpours and thunder and lightning as well. By noon tomorrow, the rain clouds will clear up. But the surrounding places such as Beijing and Pyongyang will see thunderstorms. The cloudy skies over in South Korea won't relieve us from the scorching heat as well. And as the southern regions continue to be under heat wave warnings, in fact, alerts are intensifying across more areas. We are also experiencing tropical nights as most of the temperatures aren't dropping below 25 degrees Celsius. And Seoul will have a hotter day tomorrow at 30 degrees, whereas the southern areas such as Daegu and Gyeongju will see highest readings at 35 degrees. The weather outlook shows that we are in for hotter days. By next week, Seoul's daily highs are expected to reach into the mid-30s as well. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will do it for this edition of Adilang News. Thank you, as always, for watching. Stay tuned for news in depth coming up next.